Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and as Diana mentioned, yes, the title of the slide is different from the title that I gave, but um, you can see similarities if you just sort of read between the lines a little bit. Um, uh, the reason for the longer title rather than the more abbreviated one is because there are some very fundamental themes that underlie gas markets in transition. Um, and probably the most important issue behind everything that's going on right now in the global gas market is really a US-centric story. It has to do with shale. Um, it's really important to, you know, before we begin to dive into what it means to think about a market in transition, to understand where we came from. And so what I'm doing right now is sort of, sort of setting up the, the, the manner in which this lecture, if you will, will, will proceed. We'll sort of take a step back uh, a little more than 10 years uh, and think about the world as most people viewed it then. Uh, and then we'll fast forward to the current time and kind of compare what we see today versus what we thought we saw. Uh, and you'll see how dramatically different those two worlds actually are. Um, and it's sort of a cautionary tale in a lot of ways because, you know, on the one hand, I can talk about how things happened that sort of turned everything upside down. Um, and then talk about what the future might look like. But how do I really know? Right? That's, a, that's, that's sort of the, the ever-present question. So it's always fun to forecast, and there's a little bit of that in this talk. Um, and so I've got to spend a couple of minutes, in effect, cracking all over forecasting. So that's what I'm going to do first. Okay? So, um, you know, when you think about <clears throat> looking forward, it's, it's useful to understand that when we talk about forecasting, you know, we have to be careful. And so this is a, a, a little sort of anecdotal kind of piece of evidence to, to, to highlight this point. But what you see here in the black line is the nominal price of crude oil, so it's not inflation adjusted, going back to the early 1970s. So this is the actual price on an annual basis. And then you see these colored lines that sort of launch off of the black line. What are those? Well, those are forecasts by the U.S. Energy Information Administration, if I'm talking about forecasts prior to, uh, uh, after 1978. Prior to that, it was from the Federal Energy Agency, which is the predecessor. Right? So what do we see? Well, these forecasts are pretty bad. Right? So in every case, you're looking at a 10-year view. There is some really interesting, uh, there's a really interesting piece of evidence that falls out of this, if you will. And that is, these expectations, if you view these forecasts as being sort of indicative of expectations, tend to be what we call adaptive. So in other words, recent history really drives what we think about the future. So if I'm thinking about making a 10-year forecast, and I'm looking at current production trends, and I'm looking at current price, well, the thing, whatever's happened over the last two to three years is going to really heavily influence what that view of the world is. And you actually see that in these forecasts. So a good way to sort of walk through this, because it's useful to highlight this point, is when you see prices are low and kind of flat, these things tend to be low and flat. Then when you see there's a, a, an issue, so this is the first Arab oil embargo, because we're wrong, a Iran Iraq war, Iranian revolution, you know, all hell's breaking loose in global oil markets, and all of a sudden, all these expectations, the consensus is we're going to see prices continue to rise for as far as the eye can see. Of course, then things turn a little bit in the early 1980s, and you can start to see, you know, these prices turn a little bit, but in general, people still viewed the prices have to stay high. Now, that's a really important point as to why this happened. People talk to themselves, themselves into believing this. So, Raise your hand if you've heard the story about oil prices can't get low because economies in the Middle East, countries in the Middle East can't afford to let them get low because they won't be able to afford their own social programs and it will create massive social upheaval and so the price of oil has to stay high. Raise your hand if you've heard that story. I actually, just as a, for a fun exercise, had my senior research associate go back into the literature that was written between 1978 and 1982 and there were more than two dozen articles that quoted the same thing then. What do we know about? Well, prices came down. The government of Saudi Arabia ran more than 20 years of budget deficits, and the kingdom is still around. 
Okay, so you know, we can talk ourselves into believing something simply because it's indicative of what's happened over the last couple of years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen. So why do we then make forecasts? Well, and this is really the lesson, right? The, the value of forecasting is not the point estimate. It's actually the exercise itself. So what we have to do when we develop forecasts is we have to really dive into markets. We really have to understand what's driving supply, what's driving demand. And then we have to put all these pieces together and we come up with a view. Anybody who does a lot of forecasting for a living will tell you that there are lots of caveats around any view. You have to make assumptions. But again, if you understand what those assumptions are, how they impact the forecast, how those assumptions generate uncertainty in the forecast, then you're in just a much better position to understand ultimately how markets might turn. And if you want to put on maybe a commercial hat, that tells you a better way to sort of position your firm when you're thinking about strategic planning for things that might shift in the real world relative to the view that you generated. If you're thinking about policy, it gives you an idea of, well, prices are high today, but if X, Y, and Z happen, they could fall or they could go up. I don't know what, what's going to happen, but I can think about given current situations, political situations around the world, things might change. And so it allows you to put uncertainty around all of this stuff. That's the value of the exercise. And so a lot of what I'm going to show you now is a forecast, and it's going to look like I'm coming up with this, this is what's going to happen. But what I want you to hear out of what's, what I'm saying is there are going to be elements of uncertainty in everything I tell you. Okay. And that's really important to digest. So when we talk about markets in transition, it's first important to understand, well, what sets the baseline? So at the end of the day, we like to think about this thing called total primary energy requirement. So we're going to talk about natural gas. We have to understand what gas is competing in against at the margin in different sectors. So if it's in power, it might be against coal. Right? Um, if it's in transportation, it gets, it's, it's against an oil product. So we can think of all these things, and we can start to think about, well, what's the likelihood for this competition to be fruitful in terms of encouraging that gas? And so what you have to then do is take all that on board and generate projections about where you think energy demand might go. So what total primary energy requirement is, which is what I'm about to show you, is all of the primary forms of energy that we need to facilitate end use consumption. So we're going to see a projection for oil, projection for gas, projection for coal. Right. Now we don't actually consume oil, we consume oil products. Right? But total primary energy is what is required to facilitate the secondary product consumption. So that's gasoline, distillate, jet fuel, and everything like that. So, so the first thing to point out. <coughs> And obviously, there's going to be policy parameters around this, um, which is another discussion, but just recognize they're there. Is when you look at total primary energy on a global basis, so at the Baker Institute, we actually have models that build things up at a country level, um, and then we aggregate. So what you're looking at here for the, the entire world is all the energy use for the entire world aggregated across countries. You can see crude oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, and renewable. Now, most of you probably didn't realize renewables was as big as it is, but the bulk of that renewable energy use is combustible renewables and waste. So it's burning dung in rural villages in India so that you can you know, provide it for stuff like that. Not an environmentally benign type of renewable consumption. So a lot of what's happening in the projected uh, forecast here, the projected time horizon, is there's a transition in the renewable space to more environmentally benign stuff. So if you look at this as a global aggregate, that's happening. But the one thing to take away from this is the world, if you go all the way up to 2040, is largely dominated by fossil fuels. And so, yes, there are lots of policies in place to encourage the adoption of different types of fuels. In the United States, there are a lot of um, uh, new regulations that are proposed by the EPA, which are really going to put a, a pinch on the coal industry. Uh, but again, we're not looking at the United States, we're looking at the whole world. And these regs are not uniform across the world. And you'll see, because what I'm going to do here in just a second is I'm going to show you a picture of oil by country, a picture of gas by country, and a picture of coal by country. You'll be able to see what's actually happening. Um, 
when you look at this, you might ask yourself the question, well, you know, there are all these different policy discussions ongoing about addressing climate change. And yes, there are. Right? Next year, there's going to be another big meeting about you know, adopting an international plan to mitigate CO2 emissions. Um, and that's all going to be a very politicized discussion. At the end of the day, and I'm going to come back to it, you might have noticed the very first slide I showed you was the classic Earth at Night picture, the National Geographic. Well, why is that picture useful? Well, as an energy analyst, it's useful because all those little white dots on that map, that's where the lights are on. That tells me exactly where we consume energy on the planet. So it's a useful picture from that standpoint. If you juxtapose against that where the world's populations are, you'll actually notice that there's a large proportion of the world's population that is in the dark at night. There's a whole field devoted to looking at this called energy poverty. Right? This is how much of the world's population doesn't have access to modern energy resources. Pretty big chunk. As a matter of fact, when I look at China, and I'm telling you this now because you're going to see it in the forecast, at current rates of growth, which are lower today than they were just 10 years ago, but at current rates of growth, there's going to be about 400 million people in China alone who have been in the middle class. That's a big number. That's more people moving into the middle class from subsistence level incomes in one country that exists all in all of the United States. So what happens is incomes grow. People move from poverty to middle class to upper middle class and beyond energy demand. It's a really important point. Another important point about this is that energy demand growth is higher as you increase incomes at lower levels of income. That's because what you're doing is you're moving from subsistence level incomes to incomes where energy services are more affordable and you begin to see acceleration of energy demands. As you move from lower, lower income to middle income or, or, or middle class income levels, you start to be able to move forward motor vehicles. You start to be able to drive them. Right, well, what do you need for all of this? You need energy. At high levels of income, wealth is not the binding constraint. So in the United States, in Europe, in places where the lights are on, right, wealth is not the binding constraint. Time is the binding constraint. So even if we all went out and got our cars and drove 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we'd max out what we could do in terms of energy. Now, none of us do that, right? Basically, what we do is we drive from point A to point B, we take it for granted that we can do that, and we go about our normal day life. So now imagine 400 million people in China alone being able to do that. That's why you're going to see dramatic demand growth out of those places around the world. So what you're talking about when you talk about drivers of growth in this picture are what's happening in those types of countries. So this is oil demand. This is by country. Every country has a color. I've sort of denoted a few of them so you can sort of see some highlights. China down here in red, India, Indonesia, you can see Japan, really no growth, U.S., really no growth in the oil demand. Why? Well, because the biggest driver of the oil demand picture going forward in the U.S. is not income growth, it's actually changes in efficiency. It's an important point because it, it contrasts starkly with the, with the picture that you can paint about the developing world. So when you're looking at this, most of the slope up here at the top of the diagram is driven by what's happening down here. So if I go to gas, the names are redacted, color code is the same, same kind of story. The big green one here in the middle that you didn't see on oil is Russia. Russia is a very large natural gas market. But there's actually growth in the U.S. in the blue up here. It's just by comparison to the growth that's happening down here relatively. Go to coal. This is the one that always opens people's eyes, right? Because they don't realize what the coal picture globally actually looks like. Everything up to this black line is already happened. That's China down there. That's India right there. There's the U.S. You actually see reductions in coal use in the U.S. long term. Part because gas is taking share of power. But notice what's happening. If you just go back a little over a decade, 
The U.S. and China, in terms of coal consumption, were on par with one another. Then you basically, you, you, if you have done any reading on this, you will know there were stories about the Chinese are building a coal plant a week. Right? I mean, these are sort of you know, silly things to say, but the story is basically this. There's been a tremendous amount of investment in coal-consuming energy infrastructure in China. And when I say coal-consuming energy infrastructure, it's not just about power plants. It's also about rail infrastructure. It's also about port infrastructure. It's also about everything that's required to get coal from the mine mouth to the end of In the energy business, this is a really important point, because it speaks to why you don't see such dramatic shifts in any sort of in the energy business, you're talking about an incredibly capital-intensive sector. So when I build a power plant, I'm locking myself into a particular mode of consumption for the next 30 to 70 years, depending on what type of fuel I'm talking about. Most of the coal, a big chunk of the coal-consuming infrastructure in the United States that is still in existence today, was actually built in the early 1980s. But you can think back to policy as to why you know, we ended up doing that. It was actually over policy. We will not build natural gas fire generation capacity because we're running out of gas. Nobody wanted to do oil. Oil was expensive. Nuclear was just really hard to do. It's very expensive. Where does that leave us? Coal. A lot of coal capacity was added in the United States. Now, from a climate change perspective and other environmental motivations, there's a lot of people that wish they could go back and undo that. But that's what you do when you move into certain types of fuel consumption. Because of the capital intensive nature of energy, you lock yourselves in for a number of decades. That's exactly why when you look at that first forecast, right, which is a collection of all these last three that I've shown you, it's a fossil dominated picture for the next few decades. So what we're really talking about when we're talking about markets in, tra in transition with natural gas, we're talking about slow shifts in the composition of fuel consumption facilitated by low cost resources. Gas grows rapidly in China because it's capturing margin. It's not displacing existing coal. That's a very important point. So what about the last decade? Well, Go back to this picture, right? and there's some new stuff on this picture, but it's a fun one to show when we talk about gas and particular where we were and where we're going. You can see all where, where all the lights are on classic Earth at night picture. Notice the western half or the eastern half of the United States very well lit. Western Europe very well lit. Northwest India well lit. There's Japan. There's eastern China. There's South Korea. And that's a fun one to point out because if you don't believe that geopolitics has an impact on access to energy. South Korea is not an island, but it looks like one at night. So my point about energy poverty is really, you know, salient this picture. Why? Well, because there are a lot of people that live here. There's a lot of people that live here. There's a lot of people that live in here. There's a lot of people that live down here. You see the lights on? No. So there's a lot of economic growth and prosperity that still is yet to come. It's not going to come on the back of high cost energy resources. What's the lowest cost form of fuel that exists today? It's actually coal. That speaks volumes to the forecast that I showed you. Now, let's focus on gas. So you can see these blobs of color here. Right? So if we go back 10 years ago, a little more, go back to 2003. Back in 2003, in the United States, there were over 47 different terminals that received certification to import liquefied natural gas to the United States. So that's an indicator of where the commercial mindset was. We're going to have to move gas to the U.S. Why? Well, it's evident from this picture. So these blobs of color, these are areas that are endowed with conventional natural gas resources. So this is not shade. This is conventional resource. And I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, in a couple of slides actually explaining the difference between them. But the brighter the color, or the more red, the more intensely endowed the region. 
natural gas resource. So the thing that should jump off the map immediately is that the biggest, brightest red spots are nowhere near where the lights are. So you've got to figure out a way to connect. You see any red over here? No, not at all. So if we'll go back to 2003, what we're talking about is trying to figure out a way to connect to this, to this, to this, to this. A lot of vertically integrated structures to develop fields in those faraway locations, move that gas into a liquefaction facility onto a ship, which is really, when you talk about LNG, nothing more than a glorified thermos bottle, across the ocean, so they can regas re and deliver to the United States so we can use it. Well, what triggered this? It's like any trade discussion. Price. So the era of the 1990s in natural gas markets was, you know, often it still is referred to as the gas bubble era. It's an era where natural gas prices in the United States were really low. It was a, you know, a lot of movement on the side of consuming industries to use more natural gas. But we started to exit the 1990s into the early 2000s, and a lot of warning signs started to go on that gas wasn't going to be cheap anymore in the United States, particularly given the fact that most upstream activity was directed at conventional well development. From 2003 to 2006, the price of natural gas in the United States was higher than anywhere else in the world. So people don't remember that. It's true. So what do we do when we trade? We want to go from a low price to a high price. So if the U.S. has the highest price in the world, what do we think about doing? Moving gas from everywhere else to the U.S. So that was the wave of the future. A lot of capital investment flowing into developing these vertically integrated structures to move gas to the United States. The trouble is, and this is where you have to kind of get outside of yourself when you think about reactions, right? As with anything, there are multiple margins of response. What do I mean by that? Well, high prices, yes, they encourage capital investment to move gas from a cheap location to a more expensive location. Facilitate the trade. That's great. But guess what also happened? There were some upstream players in the United States that decided prices are high enough, I'm going to go try something new. These are the mid-sized firms that we sometimes refer to as independents. Mitchell Energy went up into the Fort Worth Basin, which sits half under, under Fort Worth in North Texas, and drilled into a shale formation that was long known to exist, and that's a key point. Geologists have known about shale for a long time. When I started looking at shale in earnest back in 2006, because I saw what was happening Texas. It was like getting slapped in the face because I was reading dissertations, looking at Devonian shales, which is in the, in the Appalachian Basin, Basin, part of that grouping, the Marcellus. Right? Nobody was calling it that at that point. But, but these dissertations were written in the 1960s. So geologists knew about this stuff. It wasn't new. The issue was it was never deemed to be commercially or technically feasible. <laughs> And so it was off the table. Well, George Mitchell went up into the Fort Worth Basin and drilled into the shale formation there, about 3,000 feet down, 3,200 feet. The pay zone's about 300 feet thick, so it's not a very thick shale formation. Drilled a vertical well into it, nothing happens. Well, let's stimulate this thing. Let's see if we create some permeability and create some porosity if we can't get that rock to release the hydrocarbons that are bound up in it. And so they hydraulically fracture the reservoir. Lo and behold, you got gas flow. Still wasn't really enough to make it much more than a marginally commercially viable engine. I said, well, what if we directionally drill through this? So what if we turn the drill bit and go laterally through this 300-foot pay zone the first, first one they did was about, I think it was about 350 feet. Fracture stimulated it. What you're doing when you go laterally through the formation is you're increasing contact with the rock. So now rather than just hitting a small window in a vertical sense, I'm actually moving laterally through. 
fracture stimulate, I get a production pop, this is going to work. What triggered all this? My prices. The assessment, because nobody believed that this stuff was going to be commercially viable back in 2003 for the Barnett Shale, which is in the Fort Worth Basin, was less than six trillion cubic. <coughs> really small number. Today, most people who look, look actively at the shale, and this includes work that I'm involved in, believe it's closer to 60 trillion. So, a little, little bit of R&D. Right? And so, the shale revolution was born. The shale gale, or whatever you want to call it. Right? Call it, it was born. Because, like I said, geologists knew where shale was. As a matter of fact, when the Barnett Shale took off, there is a warehouse, well, it's actually three warehouses that BP used to own just on the northwest side of Houston up a highway called 290. They donated all, this, all the stuff in that warehouse and the warehouses to the University of Texas back in the uh, late 1990s. Well, they didn't really know what they had. Basically, what they had were a bunch of core samples. So, what are core samples? These are basically rock cuttings from wells that have been drilled all over the world. Well, guess what they had? They had core samples from shales that had ac accidentally been drilled in exploration measures. They had core samples from the Barnett, core sa samples from the Marcellus, core samples from the Fayetteville of Arkansas, core samples from the Woodford groupings up in Oklahoma, core samples from the Permian groupings in West Texas. I can go on and on. Well, guess what happened to the University of Texas because of that warehouse? There was a rush to actually look at those core samples. Because everybody knew where all the shale was. Why do I want to look at a core sample? Because it will tell me a lot about the properties that I want to go after. Tell me a lot about natural porosity within the shale. Tell me a lot about permeability within the shale. Tell me a lot about you know, what the silicate content is. If it's a very clay rich shale, fracturing won't do much because it's like firing a bullet into a piece of clay, it just deforms. If it's brittle, I fire a bullet into it, it shatters. That's what I want. So I can learn a lot, and then I can start to target my investments in the upstream. And so this started to happen in shale. Now, really importantly about this picture is I have superimposed shale on here, right? Notice where these resources are. It gives them a serious economic and commercial advantage. They sit coincident with where the lights are. On. That's really important. It's even made more relevant given the fact that the U.S. natural gas market is characterized by a very dense number. So you take all that on board, and all of a sudden, all this stuff that we were targeting for LNG development, well, we don't need it. And so we actually built a few terminals, we commissioned a couple, and they sit empty. And so you kind of keep going and lo and behold, there's shale everywhere. Of course, we know about this. Only now we're interested in trying to think about how we develop it. <clears throat> We've proven we can do it on a technically commercially feasible way in the United States. Can we do it elsewhere? I'm going to address this in just a few minutes. But this is a major point of emphasis for governments and commercial interests around the world. The stuff in Europe, major point of emphasis because of issues related to security of supply. Why? Because Russia supplies the European Union with about 25% of its gas. It's a dominant producer. It's even worse when you get into the Eastern European countries where, in some cases, countries like Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, you're getting up over 90% dependence on Russian gas. There's a lot of interest, particularly in countries like Poland, in developing shale. Now, whether or not that's going to happen, I'll get to that. But a lot of movement. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of interest in doing things in the upstream that wasn't there before. It was all triggered by what happened in the United States. Now, mind you, we're still talking about a story that's less than a decade old. Really important thing. So there's still a lot of uncertainty about the sustainability of this in terms of whether or not the production assets are going to be long lives. There's still a lot of concern about what the ultimate cost will be 
There's a lot of concern about environmental impact. You know, we can sort of run down the list, and there's still a lot of questions that remain. But the United States, shale has taken off. It represents a very large proportion of domestic gas production today. We're not talking about 5%. We're talking about close to half. All in a decade. So this is a story that has just exceeded expectations. So will this success story be exported? That's a central question that's sort of on a lot of people. So can it be and This is figurative and literal, right? So in the figurative sense, can we actually take the technologies and the processes that have been developed in the United States and use them elsewhere? In the literal sense, LNG. Will we actually see LNG export in the United States? So it has multiple dimensions. Will it go global? Will it last? These are the questions on everybody's mind. Everybody's seen sort of versions of maps like this. This is where shale is in the United States and in Canada. Can't forget Canada. There's some actually very rich shale groupings up in Canada that have yet to really be fully tapped, largely because of price. Canadian gas prices are disadvantaged relative to prices in the lower 48 because they're what we call captive resources. The only way they can get out is to get on pipelines to move to demand sources that are very far south, so there's a transportation disadvantage. So at the end of the day, what the Canadians are doing is trying to think about ways to move this gas out of the West Coast and to Asia. LNG. Natural gas supply, this is just for 2013. If I add 2014, this number is even bigger. You can see the red bit, if I just go back a decade, was almost nothing. Again, shale has taken off. This is a fun one to talk about because this really gets at the heart of why and gets at the heart of what can we expect. So we've been involved with some work, basically goes all the way down the hole. It's about characterizing well performance in shale wells. First place we started looking at this was in the state of Texas. Why? Because data reporting uh, metrics in Texas are fantastic. Far enough. So if you're an upstream operator in the state of Texas, you actually have to file a report with the Railroad Commission every month that details all of the things that were done in the well site. These are called well files. Turns out there's a company that digitizes all this stuff, so you have access to all this data. And there's only about a two to three month lag. It's pretty remarkable. So what we did is we went in and we looked at every well that had been drilled in the state of Texas isolated those that have been drilled in the far end shale and started to look at what the production rates were, what the completion techniques were, what the lateral lengths were. So you can see on these well files the location by latitude and longitude of where the wells drilled, the bottom hole location so you know which direction the lateral went and how long it was. Lots of information. So you start to look at all this stuff and you start to think about, well, how do I characterize the climb? ultimately production of these things. And you start to realize that the classic way of thinking about well production in these ultra-low permeability, ultra-low porosity reservoirs is not the right way to do it. What do I mean by that? There's a set of equations known as ARPS equations, which describe in terms of the fluid mechanics of the fluid flow in these reservoirs. It describes fluid flow in a radial sense. So it's a radial flow regime. So in other words, Imagine myself as a well bore, so I drill straight down to the ground. In a conventional basin, pressure will drive flow of hydrocarbon molecules from every direction towards me. Because effectively what I'm doing when I drill a well is align that pressure to escape up the, up the well. So the hydrocarbon molecules are driven to me from everywhere, and they go up topside, I recover them, market them, all of this. So it's like letting the air out of the balloons. When I drill into a shale, <clears throat> Nothing happens. And that's because the pore space is so tight, those little methane molecules can't flow. They're bound up. So what I have to do is create permeability and porosity, which is why I fracture. So from the well bore, I fracture. You get fracture wings that extend out from the well bore. Well, these fracture wings are the only places where there's sufficient permeability and porosity for the molecules to flow. 
So what happens is the molecules are released and they flow along the fracture wings to the well bore canal. They're not flowing from every direction, they're flowing in a linear sense. So what we ended up doing is looking at this and thinking about the physics of fluid flow of these reservoirs and realize it's a linear flow model, it's not a regular flow model. That means when you're using a regular flow model, the math is wrong. That's why none of those models fit the decline. Rate. Turns out when you use a linear flow model, you can fit the decline. Rate. It works really well. And so we can actually empirically test it. So that's what we've done. You've got to love statistics, right? You always use double, double negatives, right? But the linear flow regime, it turns out, you cannot reject the hypothesis that it is. Okay. So you move forward and you start saying, all right, this seems to fit the data pretty well. So what does that imply about these production assets? Well, you can look at developing now, since I can characterize the client reason what we call type curves. So these are just curves that define how these wells perform. And that's what these are. Okay? So <clears throat> you've got three distinct type curves demonstrated. These are developed by sampling from a distribution of initial production rates from so over 16,000 wells that were drilled in the barge. You can go into the Top 10%, you go to the bottom 10%, you go to the central tendency of the distribution. If I go to the top 10%, this is a great well. This is one that performs incredibly well. Right? You get seat decline, that's natural. You get an expected ultimate recovery that's close to 3 BCF out of this well in the Marnet. It's a, a break even at less than $3, and that's assuming a 15% return on capital. It's a great asset. This is the well you see on company investor relations reports. This is saying, look what I did. That's fine. That's nice. You can see what we have. I don't care about that. But if you go down here to the bottom end of the distribution, you'll actually see people talk about these wells as if they're indicative of what's going to happen in the basin. That's not true. This well doesn't perform well, less than a BCF, needs north of $8 to break even. This is where a lot of people will focus their attention and want to say, this is a flash in the pan. It's not so. <clears throat> Why do I care about either extreme? Because every operator in any shale has a portfolio of acreage and therefore a portfolio of wells they will drill. The operator is not interested in individual well profitability. They're interested in field development. So ultimately what I'm interested in, this is just a law of large numbers argument, is what's the central tendency of the distribution? It's this thing right here, which is roughly a one and a half BCI well that breaks even just, just south of five bucks. What this will tell me is that in the long term, if I'm in the Barnett shale, what price needs to be to make production sustainable. There are going to be good wells, there are going to be bad wells. Those things wash out against each other. It's that central tendency that matters. And so we've done this for more than just the Barnett. We've done this for the Marcellus. We've done this for the Haynesville. We've done this for the Fayetteville. We've recently launched work looking at light tide well production assets, shale oil. We're looking at the Eagleford, Bakken, and Kern. These central tendencies are different everywhere. <clears throat> In the Marcellus, because of the high intensity of liquids production, the central tendency is actually closer to between 3 and 350. Pretty cheap gas. It tells you something about how sustainable the activity up here is. When you go to the Fayetteville, that central tendency looks very similar to the Barnett. If I go to the Haynesville, that central tendency is closer to $6. So I can put all this stuff together and sample from these distributions and tier the resources, and I end up with what I can call a supply curve for natural gas from shale in the United States. That's what this represents. So we've done that for every shale in the U.S. We've actually done it for every shale in the world. I can talk about how we go extrapolate to the rest of the world if we want to, but the point here that I want to make is you go all out here to 1,400 TCF, and I get to 6 bucks. That's a lot of natural gas. 
So natural gas prices will always fluctuate. As a matter of fact, historically, among commodity prices, they're the most volatile. Why is that? Because the biggest driver of volatility in gas markets is demand. What do we use to heat our homes when it gets cold? Natural gas. So when you have a cold winter, natural gas prices spike. That's because it's unexpected. We're not producing to meet that. We produce, inject into storage, and hope we have enough to last for a cold winter. But if it gets brutally cold, we don't have enough prices to spike. That's going to happen, regardless of what I'm showing you here. So there's going to be volatility. But the central tendency for gas prices long term is going to be reflected in this. As a matter of fact, the work we've done indicates you're probably not going to clip six bucks until you get out close to the point. That's a long period for relatively low natural gas prices. So, <clears throat> why does that matter? When we sort of step beyond that and start thinking about, all right, well, gas is going to be relatively inexpensive. It's likely, particularly given the price of gas elsewhere in the world, the U.S. will be a low-cost region. Well, if you're a low-cost region, other places need resources. It opens up avenues for investment capital to flow in and facilitate trade. Well, here's where we get into can this happen elsewhere? And how is what's going on in the U.S. driving transition in the global market? So, <clears throat> historically, global gas, and I've got to preface all this by saying when we talk about LNG, liquefied natural gas, does everybody know what that is? Basically, Take natural gas, which is in a gaseous state, cool it down to negative 260 degrees, goes into a liquid phase, occupies one six hundredth of the volume, so I can put a lot more volume in a small space, put it on the ship. So I do that because there are tremendous benefits to doing this, right? It's cost saving, economies of scale in the process. And I can connect low price regions with high price. Well, when I start talking about moving liquefied natural gas out of the United States, the first thing you have to understand is the global liquefied natural gas trade is only about 30 million cubic feet a day. It's not a huge market. Currently, in terms of what's been applied for for license to export, if you add all those volumes up, applications to the Department of Energy by entities in the United States that export gas, it exceeds 30 BCF. So that's the type of something right there. It's unlikely that we're going to be exporting, I think the number right now stands at about 37 and a half. Right? So it's unlikely we're going to be exporting that much gas. Because mm -hmm. that would effectively mean we take the entire market. Fundamentally, it's not possible because in Qatar, we're the, we're the largest LNG exporter on the planet, roughly 12 BCFP, they can produce gas basically for nothing. So they're going to be U.S. source gas all day. So really what we're talking about for the U.S. to emerge into this space is capturing the growth. And then you have to start looking at the world and the growth opportunities. And as the U.S. moves into that market, how does that affect price? Because if we add 6 BCF a day to a 30 BCF market, that's a pretty significant volumetric impact on the market. That will have an impact on price. So that's one of the things that's often been lost in the discussion about LNG exports. Some stuff that I wrote about about two years ago and actually tilted the debate a little bit. But you cannot separate what's going on in the U.S. in the context of the LNG discussion with the con from the context of international trade. It's a classic trade problem. If I export from region A to region B, I have an impact on price in both regions. Now, the extent of the impact is actually what's interesting. And to dive into that discussion, you have to understand why prices elsewhere are so high. It goes back to one fundamental thing that happened, particularly when you look at Asian natural gas prices in the current context. March 11, 2011 is the date of the disaster of Fukushima. Everybody know what that is? Within a week of that, 
the price of LNG delivered on a spot basis to Asian buyers jumped by two dollars. Why? Well, because what you had happen was nuclear capacity went offline. I still need to generate electricity. So what do I start doing? I start buying more natural gas. This is an unexpected surge in demand. So do you think there was sufficient capacity to lay around to meet that unexpected demand surge? No. So you actually start stressing existing capacity in a significant way. Over the next five months in Japan, this only got worse. Why? Well, because they <coughs> subsequently shut down every single nuclear power plant in Japan. So by October 2011, there wasn't a single new car in the country. So what are they doing? They're buying record amounts of natural gas. How do they do it? Well, it's an island. They buy LNG. So you saw a lot of diversion. You saw everything could be dirt diverted from Europe to Asia diverted. Qatar is capitalized massively. You ended up distorting prices in Asia relative to even prices in Europe because there was no arbitrage capability. Because that demand surge, that unexpected demand surge, stressed existing delivery capabilities so severely that there was no flex in the system. And so you ended up in this market that seemed to be segmented into three different locations. Europe, Asia, and the US. <clears throat> I'll come back to that. So you had a price pad or a price thing that started to emerge with like this, right? These are daily prices going back to February of 2009. This is the price, this is what we call a JKM price, a Japan Korean marker. Um, it's a spot price for LNG delivered in Asia. This green price here, the green path, that's what we call the national balance. It's a notional hub, it's a very liquid point um, in the UK. The blue one down here is the one we all have come to know and love as Henry. So three liquid points typically used as indices for gas trade all around the world. So up until roughly the middle of 2010, these things drifted together. Matter of fact, I've got this data going back to 1980, and you don't see much really deviating from this kind of relationship until right now. There were periods of time where one was higher than the other. I already mentioned the 03 to 06 period, but they generally moved together. Matter of fact, up until this point, they're all LNG destination markets. So there's a point of arbitrage somewhere out there floating on the water that's making this reinforcing this equilibrium. Well, why does the US price begin to disconnect? Well, we stop basically receiving LNG. Why? Because of shit. No outlet, price stays low. You drift into this. This horizon, you see the UK price is going up with the Asian price until this particular date. That's the date of disaster for Fukushima. The Asian price spikes and continues to climb relative to the UK price and the US price until all the news are on. Classic basis flow. That's what this is. It happens on the US pipeline system every year when it gets cold in New England. You run out of pipeline capacity, scarcity rents take hold. Marketers on the system actually are bidding for capacity because they need it. And you see the price in New England last winter actually jumped over on an intraday trading basis, $100. Difference with that, the wintertime unexpected demand surge, is that dissipates very quickly. Right? This unexpected demand surge didn't dissipate quickly. It's going to take time for it to dissipate. What will make it dissipate? The addition of the new supply or the reactivation of all the new supply. These both take time, which is why this is persistent. A couple of interesting things. You see the basis widening, so these prices are higher, farther apart. The spread between the JKM price and the US price since Fukushima, you look at that spread, the volatility of that spread is three times higher post Fukushima than prior. That's also a signal of constraint. So, what will U.S. gas do? What will shale do to this paradigm? <clears throat> well, most gas that's been traded internationally has been traded under what we call long-term oil index contracts. Why? 
really boils down to a very simple matter, lack of liquidity. So gas markets are not very liquid outside of the United States. In other words, there's not a lot of buyers and sellers transacting in sort of, you know, regional hubs where there's a lot of activity. So you can sign up these long-term contracts and you can finance it and get these point-to-point -point deliveries. You know what? The U.S. market used to look like that. If you go back to the 1970s, that's exactly how the U.S. gas market was. It doesn't look like that now. As a matter of fact, the U.S. gas market is the most liquid gas market in the world. Very liquid. And so as you start to open trade from this liquid market into the broader international gas market, those liquidity benefits will begin to spill over. Why is that? Well, because now if I'm buying gas in Tokyo, if I'm buying gas in Shanghai, if I'm buying gas in North Africa, I actually have, because of a physical trade connection, the ability to arbitrage against the liquidity at every level. This has actually already started to happen. There's been interest expressed in storage assets by Tokyo Gas in the last year and a half. Why do you think that is? Because they'll be able to use storage positions in the United States to financially hedge gas purchases. Why is that? Well, because they'll be connected physically. So when we talk about markets in transition, that physical connection opens doors for lots of very interesting things to start happening. Financial physical things. What does this mean for capital markets and investment in natural gas? A lot. A lot, actually. What does it mean for contracting? It's a lot. It doesn't mean long-term contracts go away. Matter of fact, those will still be necessary to understand long-term finance for major capital assets. But it does mean that contracts will no longer necessarily dictate the direction of trade flow. Because arbitrage opportunities in capitals. This is really important because this is a feature of the gas market that is beginning to emerge and it's new. Back in 2005, short term, short term and spot trade in natural gas, liquefied natural gas, represented less than 5% of all volume trade. In 2013, it was 24%. Market in transition. So when we talk about what's going to happen, when we talk about how shale is going to matriculate out, that's just one impact. Oversupply, opening up avenues for trade, low cost gas trying to move to high price environments, liquidity, liquidity benefits begin to spill out. <clears throat> now, I'll just say a couple of things about will shale go global and then open up. Um, this is important because there's a lot of interest in thinking about can the Chinese do this. Right? And there's actually a massive shale resources that have been identified. A lot of interest in the European <coughs> Technically, yes. But honestly, that's where it stops. So, easy way to say this is geology is a necessary condition for upstream activity to occur. So you have to have the right geology. <coughs> but it's not sufficient. So, what I mean by that, when you guys take a step back and ask, well, what it really goes back to one very basic market institution that is true in the U.S. and it's not true anywhere else in the world. Producers can negotiate directly with landowners for access to mineral rights. This creates what we call an incentive of compatibility. In other words, landowners are okay with the intrusion because they're being compensated. If I'm in Central Europe and there's shale on my land and I'm a farmer, and the government comes in and exercises rights of eminent domain for the good of the country, and I'm getting nothing for the intrusion, do you think I'm going to be more or less likely to protest the act? 
more logical. It's really that simple. Now, that's not the reason it happened so fast in the United States, but that's the root of the reason. What does all that mean? Well, if you have that market institution, it creates lots of incentives for individual landowners to start thinking about looking to find out whether or not they have mineral rights, looking to see whether or not they can develop those mineral rights, monetize an asset below their feet. As they do that, it encourages small-scale development opportunities. To encourage those small scale, to facilitate those small scale development opportunities, you need to have capital flowing in the space. Financial markets are pretty fluid in the U.S. It happens. The service sector in the U.S. is incredibly key. This allows a massive amount of upstream activity to occur very rapidly. When I'm drilling wells. I pay day rates for rigs. The shorter the time that rigs on my well pad, the better. These are lower the cost. So I can figure out ways to accelerate the pace at which I can drill and complete wells. That's going to be good. But I can only do that if the service sector is deep enough to allow that to occur. Average time to drill and complete a well in the Barnett Shale, in the Fayetteville Shale, Haynesville shale is between 15 and 20 days today. Back when all this started in 2004, 2005, 2006, it was 30 to 45 days. Just imagine if I can take something I'm paying a day rate for and cut the amount of time I need it by a third, what that does for productivity. It's tremendous. Now, why can I do that? Because the sector's so deep and so competitive that they always want to go to the next venture. I go outside the United States, it's not happening. It's just not. All land-based rigs in the world, 80% of all land-based rigs in the world are in North America. Simple data. That tells you something. This is, a, this is land-based rigs. This isn't just rigs that can do a horizontal well. This is land-based rigs. Heavy, heavy propensity for service sector activity to exist in the United States is a market that's in use for it. If I go to Australia, they're tri tripping over resources like there's no tomorrow. There's not a lot of people there, but there are resources everywhere. There's only a couple of handfuls of rigs that are capable of drilling the horizontal level. So that means, yeah, I want to drill the well. Maybe if I could get into a 10 to 15 day turnaround for drilling complete wells and known assets, I could drill lots of wells. From a list of that few rigs, this is never going to happen. In China, you hear stuff out of the central government about how we're going to try to target drill 200 wells in a city one basin next year. So what? You might say 200 is a big number. No, it's not. Just to put it in perspective, when the Barnett Shale hit its peak in 2008, there were over 3,200 wells drilled in that year. The Barnett Shale geographically is a much smaller space than the Sichuan Basin. That's the thing about shale. It's like manufacturing. You have to do it over and over and over and over and over again to make it work. It's a scale by activity type of venture. So those service sectors outside of the United States need to get sufficiently deep in order to facilitate that kind of activity if you ever want to see anything else. And those haven't even touched on anything like water constraints or infrastructure constraints or pipelines or rail. What do I need rail? I need rail because I've got to move fracks out. And I've got to move water into the field. In the state of Texas right now, massive investments in unit trade yards and in rail infrastructure to get from the ports along the coast into the Eagleford up to the Permian. Why is that? Well, guess where most of the fracking come from? Come from Wisconsin. It's moved by barge down the Mississippi and into the ports. So all of that infrastructure has to be in place for any of this to work. Else I'm just drilling wells one off and 
Now this is great, nice opportunity, but it ain't going to happen in 10 years. You're not going to see the same kind of case of development we saw in the States. Rest assured, it will happen. It's just going to be a much slower grind. So that contributes to the markets and transition discussion. Because what it tells you is that before you get from A to B, there's going to be a long slog in which there's going to be need for cheap gas resources, which opens the door for Russia to Asia. It opens the door for US to Asia. It opens the door for East Africa. It opens the door for more Australian resources. So notice I just listed off a handful of resource opportunities, not all of which are shared, but they're out there. As a matter of fact, there's resources we haven't even fully yet come to understand. Off the coast of Dubai, just last week there was an announcement of a massive gas farm at depths of 24,000 feet and 6,500 feet of water. That's incredible say the least. But guess what? The UAE is in gas deficit. So do you think they're going to move forward with development? Absolutely. As they do, it's going to relieve the burden that they currently have, which is being met by imports via pipeline and LNG from Qatar. Where do you think that Qatari gas is going to go? Back out of the open market, and it's going to be traded actively in a market that's going to increasingly deep with new gas supplies. Markets in transition. So every thing that happens has multiple effects. And you kind of have to track through all those things. And then you can begin to start to picture the world as we go forward. Recognizing 